All right. Assalamu alaikum. If you recall, uh, uh, we left off with Ghazali uh, sort of detailing a second approach, or what it seems to be a second approach, whereby he asserts the possibility of reported miracles. Essentially, I uh, have to say he supports the proposition that God can do anything, right? Um, all, you know, in a way which is compatible with the idea that nature is an orderly system, uh, specifically uh, along the lines uh, of the way that the philosopher conceived that in terms of essences, right? Uh, and so he says that we, well, he says, remember, the, we can concede that fire is created in such a way that if it were to come into contact with two pieces of cotton which are exactly similar, then it would similarly bo burn both of them. So that that is to say that if in some case it doesn't burn a piece of cotton on contact, then in that situation there's some other circumstance or difference which necessary necessarily there which 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 determines or explains that uh that failure of the cotton to burn and that seems to be a necessary condition of avoiding uh the proposition or avoiding the your conclusion the implication that that things can just happen for no reason at all in which case the universe would be completely random so I was myself thinking about this, and uh, I have some suggestions to make as far as what you know, how we might understand what's going on behind the, the scenes here. Um, in terms of the proposition that God can do anything, and what Ghazali might need to, or might see himself, that he needs to um, acknowledge our necessary conditions for that to be true, uh, conceptual conditions, right? So Ghazali, of course, has to avoid the implication that there is something else in existence which God depends on, right? Uh, but the question whether or not there is not something conceptually or logically uh, a, ne a necessary condition for God to be able to do anything is another question. And distinguishing between what are truly logical conditions of the possibility of something and what are actually uh, just conditions that are not actually necessary conditions but only appear to be so through the perspective of some contingent theory of nature right which may uh, which which was which, which will be inevitably limited or may be actually wrong uh, that is actually what's it the bottom i think one of the main uh problems here or main main issues so it seems like if god can do anything then it has to follow that god can do something right uh we can all accept that i think and ghazali would also have to accept that it can't be the case that god can do anything unless god can do something and i think that the question of what are the conditions of God doing something is really the, the, the underlying powerful motive here for Ghazali to uh, lay out this so-called second approach. And that is, as we sort of saw before, um, but maybe can articulate in a simpler form here, that if God can do something, then it has to be that there is something that God does, Right? If God does something, then that thing that he does has to be a thing. It has to be something. Uh, in order for it to be something that he does, then there has to be a difference between what that thing is and what it's not. A clear difference, right? And I think the philosopher, uh, you know, uh, the, the real philosopher position here, or the real concern they have, and definitely the concern Ibn Rushd has in his response, is that, Unless the thing has a kind of a reality, unless it has a definition or an essence or however you want to call it, then it actually is not a thing, right? Because there's no clear distinction between that thing and something else, right? 
in particular that that definition or essence has to be cashed out in terms of how that thing behaves actually in the, the universe, in the cosmos, under various circumstances. So as we said before, for example, if it's not the case that fire has a kind of a reality or definition which can be described in terms of what it actually does and how it interacts with things in the universe, like the fact that it burns cotton under normal circumstances and so forth, then there's nothing there to distinguish fire from ice or water or anything else that we might, you know, say, right? Uh, and so therefore, there is no meaning to saying God created fire because there's just, in fact, no meaning to fire, to what fire is, right? Um, so it looks like in order for the thing to have a reality, right, the universe as a whole, in a sense, has to be orderly in such a way that the, dis that the behavior of that thing can be described in such a way which is coherent and consistent, right? What it is to be fire has to be described in such a way which is both true, uh, spanning the whole, you know, um, well, let's say which is consistent across the whole history of the cosmos, right? So that if fire touches cotton in some instance and the cotton doesn't burn, then there is some difference in the circumstance there, which if we include it into the description of the whole cosmos, will uh, allow us to describe the behavior of fire in an internally consistent manner, Right? So that we don't have something that, well, fire is what burns cotton and does not burn cotton. No, it would be something like fire, ha fire is what burns cotton unless it's covered with talc or some other fireproofing material and so forth, right? And so we would have now an internally consistent description of what fire does that would constitute what fire is so that there would be actually truth to the proposition that God created fire because fire would be a thing which God creates, right? Um, okay, so now, one of the things that worries the theologian's mind, like Ghazali's, is that, does this mean that these realities of things, or definitions, or essences of things, exist independently of God, and then determine, and somehow, you know, decide, right, what the actual act of God is? So that, right, God is just the one who turns things on, but what things are is already set somehow in an eternal nature of things. Well, that, not need, that need not be the case. Um, all that needs to be the case is that God's act itself does have an essence and a definition. It doesn't need to be the case that the essence or definition of God's act or what he creates is somehow prior to or existing independently of God's action. It just has to be the orderly, uniform, intelligible shape of God's act itself, right? So to speak, if you want to use the term shape, let's say, the form, right, of it, we'll say. Um, so, <clears throat> mm. so that means that, what? For God to do something, that thing has to be a, actually a reality, and for it to have such reality, it must exist in an orderly cosmos and, you know, such that uh, it is possible for things to have realities, right? A cosmos in which uh, is in internally consistent in its behavior, right? Uh, ultimately, if viewed from the perspective of somebody who, uh, hi a hypothetical person, in this case, definitely would say God knows everything, so, right, in God's knowledge, all the events in the universe work out according to a consistent pattern and order, even if and even though it's the case that for any human being, nobody has uh, the comprehensive knowledge of the cosmos such that they can actually grasp the orderliness of it, right? So there, always, there will always seem to be some things which sort of happen out of the ordinary and violate the order of nature simply because we don't understand the order of nature completely, yeah? Um, and yet it would still be the case, according to our argument here, that uh, conceptually speaking, God's doing something, God's creating something 
entails a cosmos which is orderly in such a way that that something that he does actually is a thing, right? Um, so, and, and then again, if God's doing, if, if the proposition that God can do anything, which is the proposition really that Ghazali wants to defend here, entails that God can do something, then it does appear to be the case that the proposition that God can do anything um, entails that what he does do you know, is uh, minimally internally consistent, right? And, and, and comprehensively uh, compatible with uh, the whole of what he creates, the cosmos, right? <clears throat> so there we go. It looks like uh, something of what the philosopher wants to say about the nature of nature, <laughs> right? is a necessary condition for what Ghazali wants to say about the omnipotence of God and the all-pervasiveness of divine providence, right? Um, but then there are these differences, of course, and Ghazali, as we already specified here, would definitely want to avoid the notion that the reality or the specific order of the cosmos that does exist is something that's prior to and independent and binding on God's will, right? What's binding on God here is nothing other than the logical condition of him creating something, right? And that is that it actually be a thing, right? And that entails, again, that the universe would be orderly, yeah. I mean, we do have that other consideration carrying over from earlier in the book, which I imagine Ghazali is quite sympathetic with, that God being perfect would not create a less than perfect universe and uh, preponderance of evidence from other uh, work of Ghazali uh, seems to suggest that he does believe that this is the most perfect possible universe, right? But given what he says about divine will, it seems to me to be the case that at most here he can say that this universe is not the single universe which is the most perfect one, but it is as perfect as any universe could possibly be. So there has to be other possible universes, other possible cosmoses, other possible ways God could have created the thing, what exists, which are equally perfect, equally optimal for all of the divine purposes, um, and yet, um, and, right, uh, and, but, but, but yet God, you know, has to choose one over another in order to realize one of them, and that is the indication of or the function of um, the attribute of divine will, right, as Ghazali defined it in the first discussion. <clears throat> anyway, so we get back to the, his conversation, ongoing conversation with the philosopher. Mm -hmm. And he had given two examples of how miracles can happen within the sort of hylomorphism of the philosopher. And uh, one was uh, that, uh, well, I can't remember, so the, the last one that we discussed was with regard to the, the changing of the stick into a snake, right? And uh, the, the, the assertion on Ghazali's part that it's compatible with the philosopher theory uh, that change is the reception by matter of some form, right? And that the matter has to be prepared <clears throat> correctly for that form to be received. And this is, uh, resonates again with the Quranic descriptions about how the fetus in the womb is formed through phases so that the human being starts as a drop of sperm and becomes a clot of blood and then a fetus and then, you know, is born. Uh, so we have certain phases, right? Uh, the child, uh, the baby has to grow to a child, to a teenager, to a grown man, to an old man, right? These phases occur in a kind of a necessary order because, because matter uh, has to be prepared to receive the form, right? Uh, you can't just have... Uh, intellect or a mind would be realized in a stone. No, right? That stone has to sort of somehow through some long process, right? The matter of that stone or that dirt, let's say, needs to uh, develop into a brain, right? 
through the natural processes that are described, right? The clot of blood can't have a brain, but that clot of blood in the womb has to develop into a, a brain in order for it to realize intellect, right? So in order for it to receive the form of mind, so to speak, yeah? Right. And his, uh, so, you know, that means that if a snake turns, a stick turns into a snake, also the matter of the snake, the stick has to be sort of re, uh, decomposed and then recomposed or reordered into a, a, a form which is suitable for receiving the snake form, right? In order to become a snake. Yeah. And Ghazali, uh, says, well, this could happen, you know, through, uh, just in, in a very rapid way, yeah? So it doesn't violate sort of the order of nature, but it would be an event which is within the order of nature, but just accelerated. And there's no real reason to think that there's a speed limit on nature, right? That seems kind of uh, very relative. Some things happen more slowly and some things happen faster. Anyway... <clears throat> The philosopher then asks this question, which we get to now. Does this miracle proceed from the prophet's soul or from some other principle at the suggestion of the prophet? And this gets to the question about in intermediaries, right? Whether or not nature is actually an intermediary between God and the actual event that God brings about. Um, and the problem for the Asherites with that is that it seems like that something other than God sort of then contributes to the existence of the thing and that that other thing exists independently of God, right? So imagine as an example, I use a tool and I uh, a hammer and I hammer a nail into the wall, right? So uh, in that case, I'm hammering the nail. I'm the agent. I'm the cause of the nail to be hammered into the wall. But the hammer that I'm using is also a cause, right? I wouldn't be able to do it without the hammer. So I pick up the hammer and it's because the hammer has the properties that it does. It's heavy and hard and made of metal or whatever. I, for that reason, I'm able to use it to knock the nail into the wall, right? Um, now that and the hammer is kind of an intermediary or an instrument, but that's because the hammer exists independently of me, right? If I was some kind of superhero or, or some kind of plastic man, right, I could... I could change the shape of my hand so that my hand takes on the shape of a hammer, yeah? And then I hammer it in the wall that way. Well, that wouldn't be the same, right? Because it wouldn't really be the case that the hammer is something different from me. I'm not really depending on something else, and I'm not really depending on the independent nature of something else in order to drive that hammer into the wall, yeah? I would drive that nail into the wall, sorry. Um... And that's what's the case here. If, if, if nothing other than God exists independently of God, then the idea that anything in nature might be a kind of an intermediary or tool for God to bring about some effect, like either a normal effect or a miracle, right? It would entail that that thing exists independently of God, right? But it does seem to be the case, if it doesn't exist independently of God, then it would be more analogous to a hammer that sort of my hand turned into, although it'd be importantly different because, you know, obviously we don't want to say, and Ghazali definitely doesn't want to say that the natural world is just a kind of a form of God, right? Mm -hmm. But that does lead us to that question there because we at the same time want to say that the world is not just, you know, a sort of... You know, a shape that God takes, something like that, right? Uh, uh, but we, but but we also don't want to say that the world exists independently of God, right? So, so so walking that fine line or that fine balance is part of what's going on here in this discussion. Yeah. Anyway, uh, Ghazali answers them in a dialectical way, not really in a in a very uh, sort of demonstrative philosophical way, at least at first. He says. And what you have admitted regarding the possibility of rain, hurricanes, earthquakes, etc. through the power of the prophet's soul, do they come about from him or another principle? He says to them. And he says, we can answer the question in the same way that you answer the question. So that's a very dialectical answer, right, to 
to sort of let your own answer be contingent on what the other side says, um, that's just playing the game of debate, right? That's not really uh, pursuing philosophy in a demonstrative way, which tries to get to the truth of the thing. And of course, Ghazali is basically arguing against the philosophy here for the most part, even though we would like to see him uh, proceed more demonstratively, right? Um, in any case, we'll see what happens here with this. First, we need to know what do the philosopher actually admit with regard to these miracles. So, Ghazali is again referring to some theories of Ibn Sina and Al-Farabi with regard to these matters about the prophet, their theory of prophecy and their theory and how they theorize miracles, how they theorize prophecy and miracles within the philosopher context, right? Uh, we saw that earlier with regard to the imagination and how they could know about future events, particular events, right, that are contingent and are at least not necessary and not universal and not intelligible. Um, here it has to do with the practical faculty, right? So the idea basically is that uh, for the philosopher, Ibn Sina, who believes that the human soul is a sub, an immaterial substance distinct from the body, right? Um, if you do hold that the, the soul is an immaterial substance distinct from the body and not merely the form of the body, like the like classical Aristotelians would have it, as Ibn Rushd would have it, then it follows that, you know, the soul has a kind of a relation to the body, right? As two separate things, and it can make the body do things. So your pra the practical faculty of the soul, that part of your soul responsible for or capable of making decisions and, and taking action, right? A will, right, basically in the human being, um, that can move the parts of the body, right, to pursue the aims that the mind has for the body, right? So the soul controls the body in that case, like the captain steers the ship, but the captain is different from the ship, right? So the captain has a kind of power over the ship. Well, the soul has that kind of power over the body, the ability to move the body, right? Um, and according to Ibn Sina, the power that the soul has over the body varies from person to person. And that seems to be, you know, at least uh, uh, initially plausible, right? Some people have more willpower than others, yeah? So, and we talk about that fact, you know, maybe people are training some for some sports and we would say somebody has more willpower than the other, they can drive themselves harder, right? And so Ibn Sina's explanation for that is that, you know, the souls vary with regard to strength and purity and the stronger sort of soul where the soul is sort of less enslaved by the body, it will be such that it is capable, more capable of taking command and controlling the body, right? So, since the body is a distinct thing from the soul, right, then the relation between the soul and the body which it's connected to, yeah, is not essentially different from the relation, its relation to other objects that are not the body, right? If I was, like, Aristotle and considered the soul to be the form of the body, then the relation between my soul and that and my body, because they're not two different things, right, is very much different from the relation between my soul and, you know, my coffee cup, right, or the cell phone sitting here on the table, yeah, in front of me. But if this case, if my soul is a distinct substance from my body, then the relationship between my soul and my body, right, is the relationship between two distinct things. And so it's not fundamentally different from the relation between my soul and the cell phone here in front of my desk, right? And so it follows that it's possible that, that if a soul was really powerful, it could have control over objects other than the body that it's connected to, goes the idea. And so they explained miracles uh, of prophets in that way, that in this case, the prophet has an extremely powerful soul and therefore, because his soul is more powerful than the normal human being's soul, <clears throat> it's, he's cap it's capable of moving objects which are other than its, his body, right? And so, right, um, 
you know, yeah, there, there have it. There we have that, right? So that explains some things. However, it's not possible, according to their theory, to change a wood into an animal or to split the moon, right? Those are two uh, specific miracles in question, right? And that's because, again, changing wood into an animal is, is to change the genus of a thing, right? It's as if, uh, or in the case of, like the case that Ghazali um, himself concedes, iron cannot be changed into a turban unless the iron is first changed into cloth. Right, because turbans are made of cloth, not iron, right? Because iron is not a substance that has the capability to be twisted around your head, right? Like a turban, like cloth. So, likewise, wood isn't the kind of thing that can be a snake. The wood has to change its sort of categorical change. It has to become a different kind of thing. So you can't change the genus of a thing, right? Uh, later, we're going to find the idea of changing color, the color black, into a cooking pot. And Ghazali will concede that's not possible because, right, uh, that defies logic, right? Because color and a cooking pot are in different genuses, yeah? So, um, and splitting the moon because they believed that heavenly bodies were actually sort of um, indivisible, right? They're not really material in the same sense that earthly objects are and it would be like the idea that uh, uh, the idea that the prophet split the moon for the philosopher would be like the idea that somebody split a geometrical point right I mean something which is fundamentally indivisible cannot be divided because that's it's just a logical contradiction right um, so they do have uh, let's say within their theory of Ibn Sina finds a place in the theory for explaining the possibility of certain kinds of what we might call miracles, right, uh, in terms of the power of the soul. But uh, it still rules out certain things, at least in Ghazali's account here, um, based on the conditions of the theory of nature which he deploys. Okay? <clears throat> anyway... The real question here then is about this intermediary business, right? Do we say that the miracle comes from the power of the prophet's soul, or do we say that it comes from God's power? And Ghazali says, we can answer the question the same as you. If you say it comes from the prophet's soul, then we'll say so too. If you say it comes from God, we'll say that too. But really, in either case, it remains the same that, you know, miracles are possible, and you yourself... Um, admit as much in your own theory right okay but then he goes on to say it's better for us and you to relate the miracle to god rather than to the prophet's soul yeah and he goes on to give what i think is his own um his own this, this is not really dialectical this is his own uh, uh view on what what happens here right the miracle comes about from god under the condition that the time merits its appearance, right? That is in, well, um, this is analogous to the idea of matter being properly prepared for it, right? So, let's go back. We said that the orderliness of the universe, or an orderly creation, is kind of a necessary condition for God's doing something, which is itself a condition for God's being able to do anything, right? Therefore, we're going to be committed to the commitment, we're going to be committed to the premise that the cosmos that God created is orderly, right? It's not internally inconsistent or contradictory, yeah? Um, therefore, whenever a miracle does happen, we should have, uh, in principle, a natural account for it, right? Not only in terms of how it's sort of consistent and compatible with the natural order, but also in this case, uh, analogous to that, how it's consistent with a system of God's purposes, right? I mean, snakes don't just turn into snakes willy-nilly for no reason at all, and God doesn't do that kind of stuff just to, you know, have fun or something, or just to, to, to make things confusing for us. You know, obviously the world is orderly, and, and part of God's, um, you know, wisdom and mercy, uh, I mean, definitely follows from God's wisdom and mercy that the cosmos that He created us to live in 
is an orderly and uh, organized cosmos which is intelligible, which we can discover <clears throat> and which within which we can realize intellect and through that realization come to know God. I think that's the, the, the overarching paradigm here. Yeah. So that means that miracles happen only when the objectives of God call for it, right? And so the pro this includes, at least as Ghazali points it out here, the prophet's attention is wholly directed toward it. It's always connected to a prophet because that's the aim of the miracle is to sort of establish the message or the truth of the messenger, right? Um, the order of the good becomes specifically dependent on its appearance. So that, right, the fact of God's, you know, uh, uh, domain over creation, right, uh, among other things, and the truth of and the, and the truth of the prophet that's involved will be, you know, sort of, you know, revealed and would endure, right. And so, this gives preponderance, right, to the miracle for the existence of the miracle. This accounts for the. This is part of the account of why the miracle happened. It's not to say that the miracle is something that happens for no reason and outside of any kind of order at all, or the violation of any kind of natural order. In fact, it's the fulfillment of natural and divine order in any case. Okay, now, it has to be something which is in itself possible, though, right? <clears throat> a stick can turn into a snake, but it cannot turn into a snake and simultaneously remain a stick, because that's a contradiction, right? Um... So there it goes. That's kind of what, what how Ghazali sort of outlines the sort of, let's say, the theory of miracles here, right? In terms of, in, specifically in terms of how miracles are compatible with the notion of an ultimately orderly cosmos. Mm -hmm. So, as he says, all of this is consistent with the drift of what they say and the necessary consequence for them as long as they bring up the topic of the Prophet's special endowment with a characteristic contrary to what is customary with people. For the possible amounts of that are not encompassed by the mind. Why then with this must one disbelieve in that whose transmission has been corroborated by innumerable reports and belief in which is enjoined by the religious law? Right? So if you have a theory of nature uh, within which these things are possible, right, uh, then there's no reason for anyone to deny that they happened uh, in the face of disinformation, right, according to which they did happen, because there's no basis on which to deny its possibility, right? Essentially, it's saying like this, as long as it's possible for uh, sticks to become snakes, right? <clears throat> then, you know, and, and as long as within your theory of nature, you have no basis for, you know, uh, ruling that out as a possibility, right? Then there's no reason for you to deny that it occurred in the face of, you know, um, this tradition, traditional knowledge that it happened, that people have passed down, and that have that and that have reported right, uh, and 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 to do so right to deny it you know in, in without any kind of proof, it simply seems to be a kind of act of arrogance. Then right, it's just you think that all these people are so stupid that you know even if it could happen, right, uh, you wouldn't uh, you wouldn't believe those idiots, yeah, yeah. So if a kind of a scientist or philosopher came and said, oh, uh, you know, I have this sort of scientific research report where, you know, uh, you know, we, it's been reported that they've, you know, they saw a stick turn into a snake and we explained it through this kind of accelerated hyalomorphism where for some reason it appears that uh, the matter of the stick was put through these phases of change in an accelerated way and then we ended up with the snake and what appeared to be an instantaneous uh, change, right? Uh, they would believe it and think it's okay because it's explained according to a theory which they accept, right? 
but then they would deny it simply because, uh, you know, if, if it was reported in a hadith or by religious stories, right, by religious uh, tradition, <clears throat> because the messenger is not one that they respect as much. This, this I think, is, is what's going on here in Ghazali, why he thinks that the uh, followers of the philosopher, at least, some of the, the culture of philosopher is, is basically based on arrogance, and when he thinks when it's revealed that underneath they don't really have any demonstrative proof uh, with regard to the things that they deny from uh, religious tradition, then he thinks that he's revealed that the real motive and the only basis of it is this kind of arrogance. Yeah? Mm -hmm. It'd be like maybe the contemporary counterpart would be like some, you know, uh, scientific, uh, militant atheist, you know, in contemporary times who would deny that it, who would say it's ridiculous that these people think a, a stick could turn into a snake, how irrational they must be. But then if it were proposed to him that, you know, um, they might uh, uh, in the future be able to develop a technology which would be able to transform matter into different forms like in Star Trek where you can just you know order the computer to make you a pizza and it sort of assembles the molecules required you know in some kind of strange matter you know <laughs> matter synthesizer or something right then they would think that that is possible right <laughs> right so why should it be impossible uh, and at the same time possible right well it's not it's because you think it's impossible for it to be true and reported by certain kinds of people, but you think it is possible when it's sort of anticipated by other types of people. And in the end, it just has to do with what kind of people you're talking about and, and how much respect you have for those people, right? So your justification for disrespecting a certain group or, or and, and having a higher respect for another is actually uh, circular there, right? The justification depends on your disrespect for the one and sort of high respect for the other. And it turns out to be, like Ghazali said in the beginning of the introduction, a matter of taklid and feeling of being as, wanting to be associated with a certain set of people you think are superior, right? Anyway, so how do we get miracles in an orderly nature, right? To sum up this, yeah. Ghazali actually says, right, there, there emanates to each receptacle only that to which its reception is specified by being in itself disposed to receive that thing. So what he means there, an example is that humans come from human sperm, horses from horse sperm, wheat and barley and apples from their respective seeds, right? You don't plant an apple seed and out comes a human, right? And a woman does not give birth to an apple or a horse or something like that. Right, uh, that's because or nature is orderly, or as the philosopher put it, matter can only receive a form for which it is appropriately prepared to receive. Right, that is the ability or appropriate preparation is here called the disposition. Right, so that when Ghazali, that's what Ghazali means here when he says their dispositions to receive forms differ. Due to things unknown to us, it being beyond human power to know them, right? So, or we can put it in that way. If it is possible for a woman to give birth to an apple, right? Uh, let's say that our, you know, futurist technologist says, well, you know, actually, no, we, we one day will have the technological capability to make a woman give birth to an apple, right? <laughs> With genetic engineering or something like that, right? Uh... And we only can't do that now simply because we don't know enough about how nature works in order to actually make that happen, right? If we know enough about how nature works, then we can make it happen. That's just what Ghazali is saying. Their dispositions to receive forms differ due to things unknown to us, it being beyond human power to know them. So it's possible for a woman to give birth to an apple if certain kinds of you know, conditions alter the disposition of that woman to receive the form of an apple in her womb, yeah? But we just don't know, right, what kinds of things are out there that can make that happen, yeah? 
nature is really not, we don't have comprehensive knowledge of nature. So he says, from this it has become clear to us that the principles of dispositions include strange and wondrous things. If then the principles of dispositions are beyond enumeration, the depth of their nature beyond our ken, there being no way for us to ascertain them, then how can we know that it is impossible for a disposition to occur in some bodies that allow their transformation and phase of development in the shortest time so that they become prepared for receiving a form they were never prepared to receive previously and that this should not come about as a miracle? The denial of this is only due to our lack of capacity to understand, lack of familiarity with exalted beings, and our unawareness of the secrets of God, praise be he, in creation and nature. All right. So, I think we got a good handle on what Ghazali is trying to say here with regard to natural order and the possibilities of miracles in an orderly nature. So, the philosopher ask him a very good question then, right? They say, okay, we agree with you. We agree with you that everything possible is in God's power, and that the impossible is not. Because remember, Ghazali had said before, right? The impossible is not in God's power, and the impossible is basically denying and affirming the same thing, right? It's impossible for God to make a snake uh, a stick turn into a snake, but not be a snake. It's either a snake or it's not a snake. You can't be uh, creating contradictions because that's just not a thing. That's, that's logically impossible. Um, so they ask, what is impossible, right? Because if it's, as Ghazali said in the beginning, right? If it's just combining affirmation and negation in one thing, that's just to say, if the only thing that's impossible is a logical contradiction, right? Uh, Self-contradiction, then they say many things still can happen which are absurd. So, for example, God can create will without knowledge of the object willed, and he can create knowledge without life. Yeah? They say he can move a dead man's hand, seating him, and with the hand writing volumes and engaging in crafts, the man being all the while open-eyed, staring ahead of him, but not seeing and having no life and no power over it, all these ordered acts being created by God together with the moving of the man's hand, the moving coming from the direction of God. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and the third thing they say is that that means God would be able to change genre, right? He could change substance into accident. He can change knowledge into power, blackness into whiteness, and sound into smell, right? Um, so... And they say these are all absurd things, right? So uh, let's go back to the second one here about the man, the dead man's hand, right? They're really targeting Asherite theology here, right, with Ghazali. And they're really also targeting something Ghazali himself has said. We have to remember here that this is all what Ghazali is saying, right? Ghazali is accounting, is, he's giving the philosopher argument here. So essentially, he's actually giving in the philosopher, using the philosopher voice, so to speak, to propose this argument, um, to propose this opposition to his own theological view, because Ghazali himself, in a book called Al Iqtisad fil Itaqad, uh, deploys an Asherite argument from Kalam, right, that is based on what they call this necessary distinction between the voluntary movement and the trimmer. Yeah. And the, the, the question there is about determinism and free will, right? So uh, the simple story here is that in the early days of Islam, we had this theological uh, controversy over whether human beings have free will or whether everything we do is decided by God. Right, and the Asherites tried to take this middle position, right, where God is the creator of everything and He's the creator of our actions as well, but at the same time, we have free will, right, because we acquire our actions, right, even though God creates them. And so, in some way or another, that's supposed to, you know, um, 
uh, resolve this apparent contradiction, right? So that this is, we can't really talk, we can't really go through that whole thing here. But part of the argument there against the determinists, against the people who think that human beings have no free will because everything is decided by God, they say, look, we have this uh, self-evident distinction that we make between a, 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 like a tremor or a twitch and a voluntary movement. So if my hand twitches or something, right, uh, I know that that's something my hand did, but I didn't choose that. I didn't discern, decide or control that motion. Yeah. Whereas if I reach over and pick up my coffee cup and take a drink of coffee, that is a voluntary movement. And this is a distinction that is self-evident to my, you know, uh, uh, immediate experience of the two motions, right, of the two things. Um, and that's supposed to show that there's a difference between the voluntary movement and the movement of the body of which I'm not the cause and something else causes it, right? Anyway... Uh, also, in the uh, Asherite uh, Kalam, the premise that a well-designed, ordered act proves uh, that the thing is has a knowledgeable, powerful agent is part of their kind of design argument for God's existence, right? Well, really, it's their argument that God has knowledge and power. So, we've already established there that the, in their argumentation that the universe... Uh, since it had come to be, uh, has a cause, and God's that cause of its coming to be. Uh, then secondly, they're going to say that the cause of the universe is known to be having knowledge and power because of the fact that the world is well-ordered, and any well-ordered thing, <clears throat> the cause of any well-ordered thing is got to be something that has knowledge and power, not just an accident or a clumsy oops thing, right? Because the world is well-ordered. So, the philosopher argue here, but look, if you say that, you know, only a self-contradiction is impossible, then it follows that God can make a dead man write a book, right? And do these orderly things. And then that, that will, you know, contradict your claim that we can clearly distinguish between the voluntary movement and the tremor. Because that wouldn't seem to be the case in in the case of our zombie writer, so to speak, right? Our dead body that God is uh, making do in, in intelligent things. Yeah. And it would also defy the, the uh, position that you have that the well-designed act proves the knowledge or power of the agent. Because here we would have, we would see this man writing a book, but in... We would, you know, and so, you know, we might infer that he has knowledge and power, but in fact, he doesn't have either knowledge nor power. Mm -hmm. Or it would have to be the case that something that doesn't have life might have knowledge, uh, might have knowledge or power. And, you know, that doesn't, also doesn't make sense. How could something, uh, well, according to the Asherites, right, something with knowledge has to have life. And this is also how they go about arguing with regard to, to God's attributes. They'll say, you know, God, well, once we've proved that God has power, you know, then we've also proved that, you know, the world is ordered so he has knowledge. And then we will be able to prove that God has life because nothing that has, that does not have life can have knowledge. Everything that has knowledge has life, right? And essentially they're arguing here, though, how can that be? Because there's no contradiction if I say it has life. I'm sorry, it has knowledge, right? But it doesn't have life. That's not the same as saying it has knowledge, but it doesn't have knowledge, right? And you're saying that the impossible is just to say, right? Uh, just to, to con combine affirmation and negation in one thing. To say that it is and it's not. So that we'll say, oh, if we say it has knowledge and it doesn't have knowledge, that's a contradiction, so that's impossible. If we say it has knowledge, but it doesn't have life, we're not actually involved in a contradiction, and so it should not be impossible on your your uh, your view here, yeah. And in fact, according to your theological argumentation, it is, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Ghazali says this: uh, the impossible consists of three things. 
right? He basically expands this. Affirming a thing jointly with denying it, that would be the case if we're saying um, uh, he has knowledge but he does not have knowledge, right? Affirming the more specific while denying the more general, right? Now, that is the case if we were going to say that everything, if we define the knowledgeable as the living who, you know, knows something as it is or whatever, that would be not really a good definition, right? But if our definition of, of, of the knowledgeable actually includes the living, right, then then we would then then to de then to deny life while affirming knowledge would also be uh, impossible right because it would be affirming the more specific while denying the more general yeah it's like saying oh it's an apple but it's not a fruit right well an apple is a kind of fruit by definition so to say that it's an apple but it's not a fruit is amounts to the same as saying that it's an apple but it's not an apple right or he says affirming two things while negating one. Yeah. So what does not reduce to this is not impossible, and what is not impossible is within divine power. Two and three here really reduce to one anyway. And it seems like Ghazali's just sort of expanding. Well, you know, these are also forms of affirming a thing conjointly with denying it. So when I say that the impossible is affirming and negating the same thing at the same time, uh, I really mean more than what you take it to mean because there are many different ways of self-contradiction. It doesn't have to be a simply direct, explicit self-contradiction. So, for example, if we say that something is black and white, that's a direct contradiction, self-contradiction, right? If we say that he, you know, an individual is in two different places at one time, right? Well, that's a sort of direct contradiction because, as he says, we understand by its being in one place that it is not in another place. So if we say he's in one place and he's in another place, that's the same as saying he's in one place, but he's not in that one place. As is the case here, right? If we say that it's black, we actually also are saying that it's not white. If we say that it's black and white, then we're actually saying it's white and not white, right? Or that it's black and not black. Oops. Okay. What about will without knowledge? He says, well, we understand the very concept of will, right? Is the seeking after something known to the willer, right? So part of the very concept of willing something is that the thing willed is known to the willer. If you do something accidentally, if you do something without knowing it unknowingly, then it's an accident and it's not something you did by will, right? So that you know the thing will is part of the very concept of willing it. So since we understand by the will the seeking after something known to the willer, to claim that somebody has will without knowledge would be also an impossibility of the second type which, as I was saying, is basically another form of the first type, which is another form of self-contradiction. And the idea of knowledge in inanimate matter, right? So the case of the dead body, you know? The inanimate is, you know, by the, the, not, the knowledgeable is by definition living and not inanimate, right? Uh, if that's the case, then to say that this inanimate thing has knowledge would be a logical contradiction too, and then would be impossible. So it's not the case that the dead body is actually knowledgeable, nor powerful. In that case, he says, what would really, you know, that could happen, but what would really be the case is that God is the one with the power of the knowledge and not this dead body. Mm -hmm. So there's this other bit... <clears throat> Uh, about a changing genre. A thing's becoming something else is unintelligible. So, like, the idea that the philosophers say, if the only thing that is impossible is a direct self-contradiction, then blackness can turn into a cooking pot. You know, like, a color could turn into an object. Right? But, uh, Ghazali says, no, this is not possible. Because if blackness changes into a cooking pot... Either the blackness continues to exist or does it not continue to exist. If it ceases to exist, then it does not become something else. 
Rather, it ceases to exist and something else comes to exist. If it continues to exist with the cooking pot, then it does not change, but something else was added to it. So blackness cannot change into a cooking pot. Now, this is an old right, uh, problem of change issue, right? But basically, the idea here is that if something changes, then it somehow remains itself while being different, yeah? And that can be the case within genre, yeah? So the case, the, 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 by co the contrasting case here is how blood turns into a sperm. When we say blood changed into a sperm, in this case, in the, in the process of the development of a human fetus, right? Uh, we mean that, or I'm sorry, not of human fetus, but the blood turns into sperm and that's part of the process of, of reproduction, right? But we mean that matter took off one form, right, blood, and put on another form, sperm. So between matter and sperm, we have something which is in the same category. They're both physical substances, material substances in the body, so that one can turn into another. Blood in the body can become sperm, right? So there's a common matter. They both have a common matter in which the form of blood and sperm can subsist and in which they succeed one another, right? Okay, so the, the main thing here is that blood and sperm are both material substances therefore they both have matter and ultimately there's something in common at the bottom which actually can take off one form and become another so the stuff that was blood at one time can then become sperm at another time right because they're both material substances the problem is that black is a color and an accident and, and it's not a substance, right? So blackness can't really, you know, the material does not sort of have a matter which can sort of turn into a cooking pot. Instead, the cooking pot is a substance and the black is the color of the pot, right? And so there's no way in which we can make sense at all of you know, logical sense of one turning into another. So that's why it's impossible, right? Um, and so essentially it does reduce to that impossibility, uh, that logical contradiction, because in this case we would be saying that blackness is itself and not itself, right? It would actually be a contradiction. It's either black or a cooking pot. It can't be blackness that turned into a cooking pot. But matter in the hylomorphic scheme for Aristotle plays the role of being able to make sense of how that thing which was one thing before can be a different thing now because it's the matter which is itself the same even though before it was blood and now it's sperm right and so Ghazali is really committing himself here to a, a, a philosopher concept of change which is really different from the Asherite concept of change because for the Asherites, really, for the atomists among the Asherites, things didn't really change. There's no such thing as matter. They're just atoms. God creates them. They only last for an instant with whatever accidents or properties they have, and then they cease to exist. There's not any sort of continually existing matter underneath which takes off one form or another, right? Nothing exists for even an instant. So things don't really change in that scheme. They just come to exist and then cease to exist and the change is merely an appearance and Ghazali really is saying here right that when we say that one thing changed into something else we mean that the matter took off one form and put on another that's the only way we can actually coherently conceive of change occurring and I think this represents a real commitment on his part to this philosophical <coughs> scheme uh, in very much in opposition to uh, the Asherite uh, metaphysics of atoms and accidents. But in any case, he wants to say that the notion that something changed, at least it may be the case that nothing in the actual world does change and everything is just atoms flashing in and out of existence. But he is saying here that in that case, nothing changes. And logically speaking, it would be a contradiction to say that something changed and at the same time deny that matter took off one form and put on another because that's what we mean to say that something changed and that's why blackness cannot possibly turn into a cooking pot right according to Ghazali 
Um, and this is because also, as Ghazali said, some of the Asherite theologians actually tried and to, uh, to assert that things like that are possible. God can change blackness or uh, into a cooking pot, right? And Ghazali is essentially saying, no, that's wrong because that's a logical contradiction, right? Because change means for exactly this, for matter to take off one form and to uh, put on another. Yes. And we also mentioned a bit about this. This dead man writing is not impossible. A dead man can get up and God can make a dead man get up and write a book, but it won't be the dead man writing the book because the dead body is neither a knower nor an agent, right? It's in fact uh, God who's the agent and the knower in that case, right? Um, and that doesn't really negate, so now he, he defends the, this necessary distinction between the voluntary act and the tremor. <coughs> that doesn't negate or uh, stand in contradiction to that distinction because that's something he says we perceive in ourselves. It's a self-evident experience that we have of our own actions. It's not something that we can discern in others, right? Uh, so nobody would be able to know, like let's say maybe God can make a dead body get up and write a book and behave in just as intelligibly and in a way that another living human being behaves, right? And we would not be able to ascertain whether he's living or knowledgeable from the third person perspective, right? Um, because we're not actually in direct experience of the actions that that person is taking. Whereas in the case of this necessary distinction between the voluntary movement and the tremor that the Asherites talk about, this is from the first person perspective. We have immediate experience of what happens of our own with our own body and the distinction there is self-evident between a twitch and something that we actually, uh, an action that we undertook by will and choice and, and, um, and this is a distinction that we can self-evidently be aware of in ourselves not in other people, who apparently, as far as we can tell from the outside, may be all dead bodies, which God is moving around in, you know, ways that we would expect from living uh, intelligent beings. And that can raise, I think, some difficult questions from uh, for Ghazali, if we pursue that, or at least some productive, interesting questions. <laughs>